Hello, everybody. This is going to be part one of two uh, of the webinars. We're going to be talking about recording revenue and reconciling the bank accounts. Um, today, we're going to focus on some basic concepts and reports. Uh, and then next week, we're going to talk about customizing reports, how to deal with uh, accrual basis accounting. But we need to build upon a few things as a foundation and address some questions that many of you have. So today we're going to be talking about understanding the relationship between orders, financial accounts, payments, and charge processing fees. We're going to discuss suggestions on how to set up your financial accounts. And I want to talk about the concept of undeposited funds, deposits, and transit as a method of, of easing your reporting or recording of revenue. Uh, and really, for not just for double knot, for any merchant system where you're, do, you're processing a lot of payments through a merchant account. So the first thing I want to talk about is the relationship between orders and financial accounts. Now, when somebody places an order, an order contains at least one product, ticket, event, reservation, membership, donation, whatever it happens to be. And each of those things are assigned to a financial account inside of Double Night. And when a person makes a purchase, an order is created, and that order can contain one or more items, each of which might belong to different financial accounts. When charging charge processing fees are charged, they are charged at the order level. And so when we charge a charge processing fee, it's a percentage plus a fixed amount per transaction. It's at the order level, not at the account level. So in the case below, you can see where we have an order that has two items. It has a membership and it has a donation in the cart. One is $45, one is $20, and the charge processing fee is calculated based on the total amount, which is the $65. So we're not actually taking the percentage. We're not taking the fixed charge per transaction, per order, and breaking that down to the financial account level. Quite honestly, nobody does that because we don't know, uh, you don't know how to break those things out, especially when there's a fixed price charge as well as a percentage charge for the transaction. The other thing that we have to take into account <clears throat> is that in Double Knot, we can have orders where two or more payment methods are used to make a payment. So in the example here, we have a double knot loyalty, a gift card it was used to make $10 of a payment and the remaining $12.60 was used on a credit card. So this goes to say that at a particular registration level, this payment again is made at the order, but at the account level, the item level, the registration level, we cannot report how much cash was used to make the membership purchase and how much credit card was used on the donation. So we don't split it out at that level. So transaction processing fees and payment method is at the order level. Now, if you're in a world where you're only taking credit cards, you're not taking gift cards, you're not taking cash, you're not taking PayPal, then you can you can actually run reports to say you know well everything then would be at the using a credit card as a processor so the first the reason we're bringing this up again is when people ask can we report accurately report the financial charge at the account level the answer is no because of the reasons i described can we can we tell what was paid for in cash versus what was paid for in credit card or a gift card at the individual account level or item level, the answer is no, because we can have split payments. And next week I'll show, I'll actually run some reports and, and emphasize this. So charge processing fees and payment method are accurate at the order level, not at the financial account level. So let's talk about some recommendations for setting these items up in Double Knot. 
First thing we recommend is that you create financial accounts for everything. Um, and that those accounts should correspond to the financial account or the GL account in your financial system. Uh, and they, you should have accounts for gift card sales, sales tax, shipping, as well as your education and membership and, and donation accounts and all the other accounts that you would have in your GL system. So that when you run revenue reports in Double Knot, you can record the revenue to the appropriate GL account in QuickBooks. So that's the first thing you have to look at. Yeah, and it's also important, like for gift card sales, if you're selling gift cards in Double Knot, gift cards is a liability account, right? It's, it's not revenue until the gift card is used. So any gift card sales should be reported and recorded as a liability in QuickBooks or whatever you're using for your accounting system. And only when the gift card is used, do you remove it from the liability account and record it as revenue. You wanna make sure that all events and products are assigned to the right financial account. We've all seen it where you run your revenue reports and all of a sudden inside the general uh, account, which is the default account, you'll have education events or admissions and so forth. So that you can ease the burden for the finance team, you wanna make sure that all your items are assigned to the right financial account. And when you're creating your financial account, uh, you should go in and obviously you can provide the account name, which more often than not is a textual description so the non-accountants know what account to use. You should set it so that where it says shared account, it should be at all organizations so that even if you have sub-organizations, it could reference the account that is created at the parent organization. And we do recommend that you create all the accounts at the parent organization. It just helps. You can create them as sub-organizations, but it just makes managing the accounts maybe a little bit more confusing. Uh, account type, there's only one choice here right now, and that's income. Um, and we have a GL number. The GL number there, unlike the textual, you could put the GL in the account name field but you could have education and maybe it's account one, two, three, four is the account number. And then you could include those on the report. When you're assigning products and events to a GL account, what use, what the user sees is the account name. The GL account number um, is something that can show up in reports if that's filled in. So we would make these recommendations so that uh, you can more easily manage your financial account. On this page, I have a link that does a much better job than I, than I can in describing the use of a deposit in transit or think of it as an undeposited funds account. And it goes over the reasons why, why, why you should use that, especially for merchant processing where you're taking payments. And we'll see this a little bit Later, you're taking payments. Those payments may settle the next day. They may settle in a couple of days from now. If it's an online check that's being processed through Stripe, it might be four days later. So a much easier way of handling the recording of your revenue is by using undeposited funds, deposit and transit account. And essentially what that is on your balance sheet is an account, like a bank account, and when the monies are physically deposited into your bank account, be it cash deposit from a point of sale or a, something, a, a, pay, a settlement is made into your bank account for your credit card processing, you essentially would do offsetting entries between your undeposited fund and your true bank account. Um, it's also, we believe in double not unlike what you'll see in the article, not unlike what you see in the article, but in addition to what you see in the article, we recommend that credit card, cash, gift cards, all go into undeposited funds, and then you move them from undeposited funds to the appropriate uh, account. So in the case of a gift card, we'll move everything into undeposited funds, and a few seconds later, We'll take it from undeposited funds and put it and offset the gift card liability account for when a gift card is used. 
And we'll go into this a little bit more and hopefully it become a little bit more understanding. So the first report I wanna look at, uh, and we have, we're gonna look at a couple of reports. So if you go to your financial accounts, financial reports, there are a number of reports there. So we're gonna be initially focusing on the revenue report and making sure that you understand what that is. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the payments, uh, payment by processor and type, primarily to use as a way of understanding when gift card, when purchases are made that use the gift card, which would then in a, in essentially lower your gift card liability. So you have to do an offsetting entry there. We're gonna talk about Stripe Deposit and Transit. And the Stripe Deposit and Transit is a report that says, at the end of my reporting period, um, how much monies are really in transit that haven't yet hit my bank account from the Stripe processing. Uh, and so we'll go over that report and that's what you use to really calculate the credit card portion of your deposit in transit. It's a check. And so when your accountants at the, the end of the year, whenever they're doing the audit, they wanna true up your deposit in transit account against reality, they can use this report to go and do that. And then, it's, I'm gonna spend some time on these two reports, which is a lot of confusion. It's the Together Pay Daily Settlement Detail and the De Together Pay Daily Settlement Detail by Account. I will say right now that the Together Pay Daily Settlement Detail by Account should only be used, emphasize that, should only be used by organizations where 100% of their online or double knot transactions are through Stripe. If you have an environment where you're using point of sale and you're taking cash and credit card payments, you cannot use the daily settlement by account. It will only contain the Stripe portions and it's misleading. And we'll look at that report a little bit later. So let's start with the revenue report. This is the basis for a lot of different things in the system. And I wanna make sure that you understand what we're looking at here. The revenue report, you're gonna put a date range in. It could be a day, it could be a month, it could be a year. It doesn't make a difference what it is. And it's gonna show you the following. For each of the financial accounts that are set up in this system, it's gonna show you the transactions that were taken, in this case, on March 18th on that particular day or that period of time. So at the top is the textual description of the account. Beneath that, I've added, and we'll, go, we'll talk about modifying this report next week and how we go about doing that. I've included on this report the GL account. And then what's beneath it are the items, be it products or donations or events or reservations, anything that are, or specified to use that financial account. It shows you the number of orders. No one really uses this column just other than a gauge of how much activity there was in terms of quantity. It shows you the discounts that were used against those orders. And it shows you the total. The total is the total sale amount less the discount. So I did an admission ticket for $25. Say in this example, there was one ticket that was sold. You would see one order. And if it was a 10% discount, the ticket was $100, just to keep it simple. I would see a $10 discount and I would see $90 as my total sale. I will tell you now that virtually all customers ignore total orders, ignore a discount, and ignore total. These, these, the total doesn't necessarily correspond, and we'll, we'll look at that in a moment, doesn't necessarily correspond to how much money I've collected. So um, we may have, and we'll, we'll see that at the bottom, we may have sold two birthday parties, in this case, three birthday parties. You'll notice that the total is zero, but in this reporting period on 318, we collected $400 in payments. So you might ask, how does that happen? 
So an example might be your summer camps where you have a payment schedule. So much is due at the time of the registration and so much is due at, you know, in future date or dates. So in the case of this birthday party that we see at the bottom, I sold these birthday parties in a prior period. So therefore a zero would show up, which they were sold before 318. The sale was from a previous date. However, on 318, I took three payments totaling $400 on these three birthday parties. So this is the payment. The sale is the sale amount. Again, most customers ignore total orders, discount, and, and, and total sale. This has nothing to do with how much money we've collected. At the end of the day, we shouldn't be collecting all that money, but for reporting this revenue right now, it, um, uh, it's not useful. So let's go over the other columns. The online payment is any double knot processed payment. A processed payment could be uh, a gift card, it could be a credit card, it could be it could be cash through the point of sale. It could be a check that's more often than not these days processed through Stripe. Uh, some of you are using PayPal. It could be a PayPal transaction. It's all double knot processed payments. Through point of sale, it's every everything. It's cash, gift cards, credit cards. Online, it could be a gift card or a credit card or cash, or excuse me, or, or, or check that's being used to make a payment. Important thing, this is, these are payments that were processed through DoubleNet. The online credit or any refunds, if it was in point of sales and you avoided the transaction or you deleted the registration on the administrative side and uh, you issued a refund, uh, that's what the online credit is, is any refunds. Now, for the offline debit and credit, and next week we'll sort of expand these a bit, offline debit and credit is in double knot, you have the ability to record payments that were taken outside of double knot. So for instance, let's look at the birthday party as an example. In the example of the birthday party, you could see that um, a check was probably mailed into the organization. The accounting group recorded that check, in this case, $25, into the accounting system, the UGL system, then told the appropriate people that, oh, I received a $25 check. I, I deposited it outside of Double Knot, and an adjustment was made to record that deposit that was outside of Double Knot. And the reason you want to record that deposit is if the user logs in or the user goes to make a future payment online, then you wanna make sure that the balance due is calculated correctly, which takes into consideration the cost of what I purchased, how much I previously paid online, and any payments I may have mailed in offline. Most customers put that in just to record and keep the balance due straight so you're not sending out billing notices for people that indeed did make a payment. So most customers in this report are, one, are just looking at what financial account does money go into and takes the difference between online payment and online credit and they record that into their corresponding general ledger account uh, in, in the system, okay? And most people aren't doing this daily, they're doing it weekly, monthly. Some people are doing it recordly. Whatever schedule you're going on, you would just put your posting date, number monies I processed in that period of time. And you would take for each of the accounts for general admission, you would record $932.50 into account 4220. And you would do that for the remainder of the, of the financial accounts that took revenue in that period of time, okay? Now, you would also take that gross amount, the $1,507.50, and we recommend you put that into a deposit and transit or, you know, on deposited funds account, whatever you're calling it. And you move all of that money into there. Why? 
Because if I'm running this on this day, I may or may not have had those monies deposited into my bank account yet. And so we're going to move those items into the deposit and transit undeposited funds account. And when the deposits are actually made, I will do the transfer between the undeposited funds account and my actual bank account. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more. So I take all my revenue, regardless of whether or not it's hit my, my bank account. I record it into my general ledger system. And I create an entry, one entry. Most people just have one deposit and transit account. Uh, I create an entry into my deposit and transit account and for that same amount, in this case, $1,507.50. Okay. So I do that. Now, as I said before, the money I'm processing is cash, credit card, loyalty cards or gift cards in double nut. And so I have to make sure if I was selling gift cards in that period of time, I would see a gift card account here. Maybe I sold, you know, five $25 gift cards for $125. I would then, um, I would then increase my gift card liability account in QuickBooks. I'm using QuickBooks as the accounting system in this example. And so I make sure that I, calculate the sale of my gift cards would go to increasing my gift card liability. The usage of my gift cards would then go from the, would, I would re, re, reduce my gift card liability and make sure I move the appropriate money. So how do we do that? There's another report here that's payment by processor. And the payment by process is going to have a line item. The only thing I use this report for is to say, of those sales I made on my revenue, of those sales I made on my revenue report, how much of them were for the use of the gift card, right? Use of the gift card. So what I would do is I would run that for a period of time, whatever, in this case, these reports I'm doing is the date ranges aren't all the same. I'm just using these as examples. And I would say, oh, my revenue report for that period of time, for the month of March, included $2,046.01 of gift cards were used to make a payment. So what I would do is I would reduce my gift card liability by $2,046.01 because that's what was used for the form of payment, okay? I would also, for that reporting period, then reduce my deposit and transit by that amount as well, okay? Let's go on to some other reports. And this is the report that confuses a lot of people. This is the report where uh, we're talking about together paid daily settlement by account and together paid daily settlement detail. And as I said before, and I emphasized before, the daily settlement by uh, daily settlement by account report should only be used if 100% of your payments are processed through Stripe, which is not the majority of you. Well, let's go to this report, and here's why. I could have a daily settlement, and I'm going to talk about this in more detail. I could have the together pay daily settlement detail report, and I will see on a particular day, this is, if I look at my deposit for the settlement on that day, probably be a deposit on the 28th, but I can see my bank account had a deposit of $2,100.50, $50.11. We actually do a search in double knot whenever we get the settlement files from Stripe. We do a search and we say, do we find all of those for what was deposited? Do we find all of the transactions? These two should always be equal and the variance should always be zero. There are occasions where we see it's off and then we have to do some investigation as to what happened and uh, we'll make sure that we correct that. So here is my total deposits, right? We found a corresponding value of payments inside of DoubleNut. 
and the charge processing fees for those payments was $62.90. The net here, uh, we're gonna be changing this report, but I'll talk about that in just a moment. So in this case, this total payment, the total deposit that was made into your bank account includes, and let's take this an example. Say you have an event that cost $100, and charge processing fees were 2%, $2, you would see $90 deposited into your bank account. And so you have to make sure, and we're gonna change this so the net here is really gonna be the gross event payments. And so this would be the amount that would be for your overall event payments, not taking into account charge processing fees. So when I'm making a deposit. So if I were to go and getting back the deposit in transit before, I would have to go in and I would make it, you would see a bank account uh, deposit of the 21.50, 11 cents. But your deposit in transit has to be reduced by more than that because your deposit in transit is gonna have $100 in there. And so you're going to have to take into account the charge processing fees as well. So you can see $90 deposit, $98 deposit for that $100 payment, the $2 charge processing fee. And you're going to want to make sure that you add those back in order to reduce the daily the, the deposit and transit by the appropriate amount. And we'll get a little more conversation into that next week. Today, I just want to do a high level and talk about the reports, and then we'll go into more detail on this next week. So this is our Together Pay Daily Settlement Detail Report. So some people are liking the Together Pay Daily Settlement Detail Detail by account, because it is showing, it is showing of the monies we took that were deposited into my bank account, what were the monies by financial account, okay? However, that works if 100% of my transactions were in Stripe. If we have a blend of cash and gift card and credit card, and some of those are split payments where we use possibly cash and credit card, cash and gift card, or credit card and gift card, what you're going to find is that you're going to have variances on this report. So look at this example. In the Together Pay Daily Settlement Detail for 322, I have a $25 variance on 323. I have a $250 variance. And the problem with that is split payments. So again, only use this report as much as you like it. It's not accurate unless you're doing 100% of your transactions in Stripe. And also, this report is not capturing cash and gift card transactions. So for most of you, you have to stick for the Together Pay Daily Settlement Detail. And the Together Pay Daily Settlement Detail will show you here all the transactions that comprise that deposit. And so what you would see is a $33.90 charge, it's the same order number, of which $1.59 was the charge processing fees. So you'll see all of those details beneath it and when the deposits are made. Now, the you'll see the transit, not when the deposit was made, but when the transaction date was. So here's an example of a settlement file on 327, which consists of transactions from 322, 323, maybe even 324 and 325 if it was over the weekend. So you, the deposits that hit your bank account, you, you can't say, oh, the transactions I take today are gonna to hit my bank account tomorrow. Depending on the time, that may or may not be, that may or may not be true. Depending if your transactions uh, in, was an online check, it takes longer because of the ACH system to process check transactions. You might find it takes three or four days for a check to be settled in your bank account. A charge might be tomorrow, 
a refund might be the day after that. The point of this conversation is you will find that my deposit for a particular day, more often than not, will consist of transactions that happened yesterday and maybe up to four days ago because of ACH. Just keep that in mind. Some of you, um, a lot of organizations, not even a lot, some of you will use this report to figure out, okay, when should I record the revenue? And if you go and take that approach based on individual transactions settling into your bank account, it's a pretty onerous process. That is the beauty of the deposit and transit approach when we go and we're doing this. Okay. Now, again, we're going to circle back on this next week and, and some more detail or in the next webinar. Um, now, what happens is, and I've been talking about deposit and transit, AKA undeposited funds. Uh, and eventually you're gonna wanna true that up. If you have, if you're a report, if you have a system and you're trying to figure out what undeposited funds were at the end of the year, your accountants wanna see what that amount consists of. We have a report for the stripe portion of that. And I'm emphasizing the stripe portion, which you could take cash in the system and we don't know what you actually deposit that cash, right? So you have, whenever you make a de cash deposit, we're recommending that you reduce your deposit in transit when you increase the amount in your bank account. We, we, we suggest that whenever you uh, make a credit card transaction or deposit is made, you do the offset of, of deposit and transit and your bank account to make sure you move the money from deposit and transit over to your bank account. And we have a report that periodically can be used to true up, to validate the amount of deposit and transit at, for the credit card portion. Cash, we don't know when you're making your deposit, so you'll have to make sure you do that. So here is a report, and right now it's beta, uh, but it's, it's an accurate report. It's the Stripe Deposit and Transit Report. And the Stripe Deposit and Transit Report, I can say, show me the deposits and transit. Show me the money that have, that, for transactions taken before 331 that haven't yet settled into my bank account. This first value here um, just should be back a week. You know, how long... As long as it's back five days, that gives plenty of time for the ACH processing to take place. We're gonna change this report and make it a non-beta, you know, I'm gonna enter one value here. So in this case, what I am looking for are any transactions that have not yet the pod that I, for transactions where the posting date was on or before 331, that didn't settle into my bank account as of 331. So what this report says is that we have 136 transactions uh, consisting of $5,235.33 of payments and $22.60 of payments and charge processing fees of $169.91, okay? That haven't yet deposited or the pot deposit was made at or 331. So in this case, you can see here are all the transactions that in this case were taken on 329 and 330 and there was a longer list here, 136 of them. And here is the dates they settled. It would be blank if they hadn't settled yet. So if I was running this report on 4-1, there'd be a lot of blank dates here um, for that because they haven't settled yet. But in any case, these show you that they settled after 331. So our deposit and transit would be the 5,235.33 plus the refunds. And then we have to take away or add back in the transaction fee um, for that. Because remember our deposit and transit is the gross amount that we're paying, right? If that event costs a hundred dollars, deposit and transit is $100, it's not less the charge processing fee. Charge processing fee you're gonna put into a um, bank fee or a transaction fee account on your, uh, in your GL system. 
And next week, again, we'll go over this in more detail and hopefully clarify some of these things. But the Stripe Deposit and Transit Report is something you use to true up whenever. It doesn't have to be every month. It doesn't, but whenever it's required for you to validate the amount or the stripe portion of the amount of your deposit and transit report, uh, excuse me, a deposit and transit account, you could use this report for the stripe portion. Cash, again, you have control of that. We don't know when that is actually uh, being deposited. So I'm going to summarize here a few things. And hopefully next week will help clarify a few things. Is here's what we're recommending is that the together pay daily settlement report will show the stripe deposits that settled into your bank account for a given day. As those deposits are made, you're going to put an offsetting entry against the deposit and transit account. So you're going to reduce the deposit and transit now that it has hit your bank account. When money is placed in deposit and transit, it doesn't include the transaction fee. Therefore, you have to take the transaction fees into account when essentially grossing it up in order to uh, offset the deposit and transit by the appropriate amount. Transaction fees, you're going to move into a transaction fee account uh, when you're going and doing that. Gift cards, the payment by processor report is going to show you the gift card the, the amount payments that used gift cards and therefore you have to reduce your gift card liability account and you also need to reduce the deposit and transit so we recommend you run the revenue report you put the you put all the money in the deposit and transit gift cards is only going to be there a couple of seconds which you're going to go and run you're going to do an offsetting entry against your deposit and transit for your cash Anytime you make a cash deposit, you're going to reduce your deposit in transit because all of the monies that were processed through Double Nut, credit card, check, gift cards, cash, go into the deposit and transit account. And so, therefore, anytime you make a deposit, you're going to want to reduce your deposit in transit or um, um, on deposited funds account. And then finally, we talked about. How do you go when you true up the strike portion of your deposit and transit uh, account? And that uses the, um, the, the stripe on deposited um, report. So you're going to want to run that. As for your cash and using the sales station, you're going to have from your register uh, the cash portions that were uh, transactions that were made and those should correspond the cash deposits that were made into your bank account. You might do that daily, you might do that weekly, you might do that monthly. Whenever you make a deposit for cash, you'll have to make sure that you offset the cash deposit, your the deposit and transit amount by the amount of cash you're depositing into your bank account. Now, You'll have to make certain adjustments for cash. So maybe you were short cash, or you you had too, you know you, you had too much cash, whatever. But you'd make the appropriate adjustments against your deposit and transit account to account for those types of things. So that sort of concludes what I want to talk about today. Next week we're going to touch on these again. We're going to go into the revenue report and we're going to customize it. We're going to talk about. Uh, recognizing revenue when you accrue revenue. And that's an interesting conversation because I've had a conversation, we've had a conversation with many of you lately talking about your process. And as I talked about in the beginning of the webinar, some of you might do a year end catch up. So in the end of 2023, you might say, okay, what revenue do we have for events happening next year? And you'll do a one time adjustment for accrual. Some of you will accrue um, memberships. Some of you don't accrue memberships. So there are various ways you do that. So I'm gonna show you next week, how do you create and run reports that show you monies for things that are happening in the future. And then you'll be able to determine based on your internal process, which of those monies do we defer and which of those monies do we recognize uh, immediately. And so that we'll be talking about 
in the next the webinar, which I believe is going to be next week. So that's part one. I also encourage you that if you have any questions after you watch this, send those in. And then if there's time next week, we'll go over your questions and uh, take it from there. We realize that all of you have little differences in the way you record and report revenue. Um, and so those questions should be, you know, for clarification, what I've talked about, or in your situation, if you have a unique case or you approach something a little differently, we could talk about that. Um, but one of the things I do encourage you is to go and read that article that we talked about in the future. We'll make sure we put that link there. Go and read that article about the justification or the reasoning behind using the deposit and transit account. So I hope you enjoy this, hope you learned something, and we'll go to part two of this webinar uh, in a week or so.